Welcome to episode 53 of Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond, a global communication skills training organization. Use your words to paint a picture in someone else's mind. That's how my guest this episode, Ryan Estes, describes a great communicator. Ryan is a leader in the podcast space, having co-founded podcast advertising platform Wildcast and Kitcaster, which gets you booked for podcast interviews. In this episode, we discuss how to use repetition to get your message across, why you need to adapt your approach based on your communication venue, and how communication is a lot like jazz. I hope you enjoy. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today. Scott, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Glad to do it. To kick things off, Ryan, why don't you tell the listeners just a little bit about you, your journey, and what it is that you're working on today? Happy to do it. So my name is Ryan Estes. I am the co-founder of a podcast advertising platform called Wildcast and a podcast booking agency called Kitcaster. So I live in the podcaster space. In addition to that, I have a wonderful wife. I've been married 18 years. We just celebrated our anniversary. And I've got two kiddos that are in high school. Um, So, you know, if I'm not working, I'm usually kind of toting them around uh, to all of their social and sports commitments. Um, Besides that, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I live in Colorado. If you kind of looked up, you know, Colorado guy in the dictionary, you'd see a picture of me with my fishing rod and (laughs) going hunting. And I like to be in 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 the outdoors as much as possible. Um, I, I train martial arts here in Denver. And aside from that, I try and get out as much as I can with my buddies and listen to some jazz, maybe have a little uh, Japanese bourbon here and there, I guess, or Japanese whiskey, as it were. Yes. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's my story in a nutshell. That is quite interesting. You definitely stay busy. And with <laughs> having two kids in high school, you could probably add like part-time Uber driver or chauffeur, chauffeur to that resume list. I'm sure that that definitely keeps you on the move. It never ends. And I, uh, my daughter turned 16 in June. So she she gets her driver's license when she gets all of her prereqs buttoned up with the state, I think in October. So a part of her getting a vehicle is going to be toting her little brother around. So there I, I'm, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still a few years away from that, but I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Looking forward to it, maybe not looking forward to it at the same time, but it's bittersweet. I know it's going to be kind of sad. But I mean, some of the best times I've had with my daughters is driving her around to mm-hmm. school and her, her st- you know, she's got a job now and she's got all her friends. So, you know, she's growing up. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the phases of life. It's it's always interesting to, to chat with somebody that's going through very similar things. You mentioned a lot with, with your career background, really being in the podcasting space and both, you know, co-founding businesses, leading businesses, dealing a lot with this podcast area. So I would imagine in your journeys, you've come across some really great communicators and maybe Mm -hmm. some not so great communicators. But if I were to say to you, Ryan, paint the picture of what does a great communicator look like? What comes to mind for you? You know, a great communicator to me is someone who can uh, skillfully paint a picture in a person's mind. You know, I think the best communicator has an ability to find the essence of what's important they're trying to communicate and then very clearly and succinctly put that into somebody else's mind. I mean, I can get a little esoteric at sometimes or at times thinking about communication, just kind of how bizarre it is on a analog fundamental level. You know, the fact that I have vocal cords that vibrate that vibrates the air that goes through the air into the microphone, into the interwebs, out uh, your speaker into your ear. And, and hopefully I'm able to put a picture that's similar to mine inside your mind. I mean, just the actual fact that that occurs is kind of miraculous, yes. you know? So the, the, the communicators I really look up to are the ones that are able to kind of uh, transmit information uh, clearly and succinctly. I love the paint, the picture that you painted there. And the interesting thing is with so many steps in that journey from your brain to your vocal cords, through the microphone, into my ears, all that good stuff. 
there's definitely lots of opportunity for things to be lost in translation, so to speak. And you mentioned you want to be clear and you want the receiver to basically pick up what you intended. You know, I, from my experience, a big part of, of being clear with your communication and making sure people really understand what's going on is trying to incorporate stories to help bring clarity. What's been your experience with using stories in communication? I agree a hundred percent. I think naturally, you know, our brains and our social uh, interactions are really a technology that have led to the the success of our species. And if you look at the, that communication, it's all based in stories, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps more, we we're huddled around uh, a campfire, just kind of retelling what happened during the day. Um, in those more primitive times, our language was had very few words, you know, so you're able to enact with your body, you're able to use expression and emotion to paint a picture, to put somebody there, ultimately for kind of an, uh, a symbiotic, empathic experience where they're feeling what you felt um, so that the, the, the communication is, is multi-layered. So I think uh, storytelling is critical. Um, I think it, particularly in this day and age where people's attention span is, is at a bare minimum. Um, one thing I've noticed with good storytellers, and I learned this from Stephen King in his book on writing, uh, is you start as close to the end of the story as you possibly can. Like, let people know what the ending was first, if you're telling a story. And then once you've got them sucked in, now they'll be a little bit interested on how you arrive there. Um, to it, on the opposite side, people that are terrible storytellers <laughs> will droll on and on forever about something that happened and that it never resolves with any kind of punchline. Yeah. And the listener's sitting there like, I can't believe you just wasted seven minutes of my life with a story that went absolutely nowhere. So the the storytellers I always admire are the ones that hit you with the punchline and then allow for you to come into the story. You know, I don't want to hear what you had for breakfast. If you're telling me about a car accident, you got in at lunch. It's like, Oh my gosh, at lunch, I, I just got in this car accident and someone's like, Oh really? And then you can maybe get into breakfast. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a certain pacing and storytelling um, that allows the, the listener or the audience to kind of be drawn into it organic organically. Yes. A lot of times people bury the lead when, when they're going with, with the story, as you mentioned, they're not getting to the key part or their meaningful narrative or their main message soon enough. And oftentimes never getting to it. Or when they do, other people have turned out, tuned out already. So this idea of when you are telling stories, right, you want to get your key message out there very early on. This is kind of what I'm trying to, to get at. And then you should have some key foundational building blocks that are going to roll up to that big message and then try to build in some little stories for each of those building blocks. When you have a framework like that, it really helps to capture the audience's attention, keep them engaged. And something you hit on a little bit ago, it brings about the feelings, right? When you can get to their feelings and their emotion, we like to say people make commitments with their hearts. They make decisions with their hearts. When you can get to that, that's really powerful in communication. I totally agree. And I'll kind of build on that a little bit with the story, if I may. Absolutely. Um, my grandfather was a major general in the Marine Corps. He was the commanding officer at Camp Pendleton um, and was basically head of recruitment at his times in with the Marines. And he was a beautiful and amazing speaker. He had the, the capacity to draw everybody in, to make uh, everybody feel like he was speaking to them individually in a large group. You know, I think he um, uh, commanded over 60,000 men um, at his funeral, rest in peace. Um, there were so many people that came forward to say like what an impact he had made, but particularly on, on how his communication style made them feel endeared to him. Um, I, I was enamored by the man. And one thing I used to, to ask him is like, how can you do that? I, I watched him give speeches that were absolutely captivating, captivating. And he would say, Ryan, the trick is to do this. He said, tell him what you're going to tell him, tell him and tell him what you told him. 
So you, you begin to get kind of repetitions and also mm -hmm. people know what they're in for. You know, I'm going to tell you a story uh, uh, about the car accident I got into today at lunch, and then you expand from there and then you recap it at the end. So not only are you giving people the, the decency to let them know what they're in for, but at the end, you're recapping it for them so that they have a, a, a clear idea of exactly the, the beats and the points that you were trying to make. The beautiful thing about storytelling, and he sounds like an amazing, amazing man, an amazing communicator. You know, this, this great thing about storytelling is that it can apply to every aspect of life. Think People sometimes just think about storytelling when it comes to hanging out with your friends or grandparents passing on messages down to kids and grandkids. But if you even just think about a business setting, if you're trying to, maybe you're in sales or you're really pitching a new initiative at your organization, this idea of high level, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you, then I'm going to recap it. It overlays into pretty much any scenario you can think of very, very well. Here's my core message. I have a few building blocks, few key components of that message, and ideally I have some sort of little story or analogy for each one of those building blocks. So it doesn't always have to be, I was in a car wreck or you know, I got you know, held up at knife point or something like that, something you know dramatic. It really is you follow a framework for how to get your messages out there will capture people's attention. Absolutely. And if you, you're considerate of their attention, also to kind of understand that most people are just waiting for you to stop talking so they can start talking <laughs> yeah. for, for better, for worse. I mean, that's kind of how it goes. So by presenting an agenda, it's like, this is the roadmap to when I stop talking. It gives me at least the best opportunity mm -hmm. I possibly can that someone will give me the benefit of the doubt and actually listen as opposed to waiting to kind of chime in. You know, I, I, I was on a, uh, uh, a Zoom call once where someone was giving a presentation and we're probably 40 minutes in on the Zoom call and I can tell we're on slide seven and there was 28 slides in the deck. So I'm just doing the math here. I'm like, oh my gosh, how long am I committed to this Zoom call right here? How am I going to get out of here? <laughs> you know, you got to give somebody an escape plan so that they understand that at some point you're going to stop talking. Mm -hmm. You nailed it, right? You provide them <laughs> the roadmap so that they ultimately know to pay attention because at some point you will have that break and they'll have the opportunity to, to interject, respond, ask questions. Absolutely love that. Ryan, as you think about the perhaps the space that you're in, whether specifically to the podcasting industry or just in general as as a leader, founding businesses, you know, if you look at the skill set that's really necessary for employees to be successful in the workplace today, what are some of those foundational communication skills that you really look for in people? You know, I'm looking for kindness, I think, first. Um, people that are kind to uh, each other and people that are kind to themselves. Um, I, I think a, a part of that is also kind of understanding the reality of uh, human nature. You know, and we talked about a couple of those things now. Oftentimes they could be looked at as kind of negative. But if you take the judgment out of human nature, which is to say that people have very short attention spans, it's like work around those parameters. You know, I, I kind of have a little say, saying that like, you know, you kind of got to tell somebody something 10 times before they hear you one time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been very challenging because I, it's like you start doing that, repeating yourself all the time. You're like, boy, do these people, you know, do they think I think they're stupid or something? Um, <laughs> but rather it's a actually comes out of a deep respect of understanding like how people are. And, you know, particularly, you know, we're more and more, we're, we're communicating through Zoom calls. And if I've got someone in, in front of me, I might, if I'm lucky, I got 70, 80% of their attention. If they're on a Zoom call, I might have 10% of their attention. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're typing out emails as I'm talking and different things. So, you know, if I'm lucky, 10% of my information is getting through. So if normally, you know, I need to tell somebody something 10 times in order for them to hear it one time. Now I may have to tell them a hundred times for them to hear me one time. So that kind of repetition is, is something that I like to try and put into my communication and something I like to express to, to my team as they're presenting 
and to to not be pessimistic about it, not not feel down about like why don't people listen to me? Why aren't people getting what I'm trying to tell them? Rather, with a deep respect with how they are as people, that it's up to you to to show repetition and consistency in your communication so that they can get it. And I think this point is is best underlined by music. You know, like if you if you take blues music for example. They always repeat the first stanza twice, and then they got a conclusion at the end, you know, and then they're going to come back to that in the chorus. There's a lot of repetition, you know, in music, they call them hooks because this is the thing that you latch onto. And there's definitely been songs for me that I've enjoyed for decades that at some point it clicks and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just figured out like what they're saying in that lyric. And so that might've been a thousand times that I had to hear it before it clicked one time. You know, and I, I don't think anybody else is too dissimilar to me, especially if I'm introducing new information, you know, so understanding, particularly within with inside teams, if you're creating change, that's going to throw off their capacity to 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 hear you um, and out of respect of everybody, out of respect for yourself, the understanding that like with slow, consistent, uh, repetitious <laughs> communication, this is your best best bet to be able to kind of really have those uh, light bulb moments for people that are like. I get it. And I will say with an 11 year old and a 14 year old at home, I get lots of practice with repeating myself over and over (laughs) again to try and get that message through. And what I found is definitely repetition helps Two, providing context helps. The reason I'm saying this so much, or the reason every time you walk out the door, I say this to you is you make good decisions or whatever it is is that X, Y, and Z. So as you provide context, in addition to repeating something when it is important, and then I think the third layer is looking at multiple different communication channels, right? So if you're in a business, you might do something on an all hands call, then it's going to be followed up by an email message that goes out. And then perhaps something is later on Slack, then it's coming back up again in a text message. When you see somebody in the hallway on a Zoom meeting, So leveraging not just repetition, providing the context, and then also layering in how do I use all the different communication channels at my disposal today? Yeah. Well, repetition builds trust, you know, to that point that, you know, for Kitcaster, let's say we have a three-step onboarding process. Um, If you go to the website, you'll see it, one, two, three. If you look at our proposal, one, two, three. If you do a demo with one of our AEs, we have a three-step uh, onboarding process, step one is. So although they're not going to consciously recognize that like, oh, in all these different places, there's a three-step process um, that is telling me the same thing. It, it feels familiar when somebody's beginning. You know, mm-hmm. so again, it's building trust, building consistency, showing intelligence, sh- showing systems and processes, showing that basically if you're going to do business with this person, you you know what to expect um, because things are going to be laid out in a way that's uh, digestible and understandable to you. Absolutely. When you have that consistency, your words match your actions and you do that time and time again, definitely going to lead to to that trust. Absolutely. Ryan, if I were to ask someone close to you, whether it is you know, maybe a family member, someone that you, you've you worked with for quite some time, you know, what would be the one skill that has helped Ryan get to where he is today? You know, what might they share with me is that core foundational communication skill that's led to your success? Well, that's a terrifying thought that <laughs> you'd be having that conversation. I don't know. Would, I wouldn't want to know. <laughs> no, I, I think it's probably humor and brevity. Um, I think that's been really successful for me and bringing that into my communication. Um, largely, it, it makes me really attached to communication because there's a certain spontaneity and wit uh, associated with being really present, present in a conversation. Um, and I think it also uh, can convey just like a sense of friendliness and again, trust, you know, of like, Hey, this is kind of a lighthearted thing and I feel good and you feel good. We can, we can kind of have a fun time here. Um, I think that's really helpful in communication professionally. Um, and I think it also really set the tone for how I like to parent, you know, because, you know, as a dad, you know, you got bedtimes, 
And it's obnoxious when your kid's seven years old and you're trying to get him to bed and it's 1030. You know, at some point, you know, you're just going to be like, just go to bed. You know, you feel that that feeling. Um, but particularly with with my kids, they kind of took after me and like they're talkers, you know. So mm -hmm. a lot of times my son, he's just, he would say, Dad, just keep talking. Just keep talking because, he, he, you know, we're, he likes the banter and mm -hmm. I would get in on, you know, whatever he had question about. I would just go to my fullest extent, which wasn't very far. Um, but nonetheless, at 1030, you know, I'm like, hey, man, I'm ready to do my own thing here. And I start to feel that big emotion arise, which is like, you know, get out of my way. Um, but I also would feel really guilty if I was making my son to feel like I didn't want to talk to him anymore, even mm -hmm. if it was past his bedtime or whatever. I, I always wanted to make sure that like he knows that I like to hang out with him, you know. So one thing I used to do is when I was starting to feel that thing come up, and of course your your the the, the tone of your voice changes, your body language changes, these kind of things, and he can tell which ramps him up more. He's getting more and more agitated, no, noticing that dad's trying to get out of here. Dad's getting more and more agitated, and so I would say I would say, son, it's time to go to bread. And then he'd get a little twinkle in his eye. He's like, did you say bread? And I'm like, no, it's bread time. It's time to go to bread. So <laughs> there, I was able to like kind of have fun with the sternness, you know, but also the sternness is coming through where he does understand it's time for bread. Yeah. Um, so he could go to bed and we could kind of laugh about it. But like, you know, um, there, there's truth in the emotion, um, but humor is just enough to take the edge off to, mm -hmm. to at least when he was a small boy, let him know everything's fine. You know, we'll do this again tomorrow night. We'll, it'll be bread mm -hmm. time tomorrow night too. Um, so I think probably if you, if you talk to the folks around me, I, I think humor would probably be what they might say if I, if I was being generous with their opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's fantastic. Time for bread. As, <laughs> as, I, as I was listening to that and you know, humor does come up a, a good bit in my conversations and, you know, everyone has a much different sense of humor, style, things like that. I always caution people, especially like if you're giving a speech or a presentation, if you're not the traditionally funny person, tread lightly, right? And obviously just be very mindful of some of the things that you're saying. But you know, ultimately what I heard from, from your response was two things, authenticity and being present. Regardless, mm -hmm. so if, if you have a, a great sense of humor, you're a funny person, you like to joke around, or not, maybe you're just a very kind, open-hearted, warm person, really kind of trying to, to be true to yourself, let that shine through. So this idea of authenticity in communication and then being present, right? You know, really mm -hmm. spending that time with your son and then ultimately coming up with some sort of tool to wrap the night up, to wrap the conversation up. So I think anyone, regardless of your communication style, or if you just focus on being authentic and being present, it's a huge, huge benefit to, to your communications. Totally agree. And making sure the incentives align, you know, the more, you know, uh, authentic, the more spontaneous, the more empathetic, empathetic you are of what other people want, the, the better you'll be able to be in a position to give it to them and satisfy yourself, you know, then everybody wins. Absolutely. It's always good to get those win-wins. As you think, Ryan, about your communication style, you talked a little bit about the humor, the brevity, and just importance of you know, listening to people and digging in. You know, if you think throughout your career, who has perhaps been somebody that has influenced that communication style? Maybe what's something that you took from them, tweaked a little bit and put it in your tool belt, so to speak? You bet. Uh, my grandfather, Opa, definitely comes to mind. He was an absolute master. Um, when I'm thinking about other kind of inspiration I've had, uh, communicatively, communicatively <laughs> talking, um, it, it, this might be a stretch, but, but I'm going to say Charlie Parker, yard bird Parker, who if folks don't know, was basically the inventor of a genre of music called bebop. He was a, a jazz alto saxophone player. Um, and his, his kind of revolutionary technology he brought to that instrument 
um, was the ability to play lots and lots of notes very, very quickly. Bebop is a very aggressive style of jazz, um, almost impenetrable uh, by people that are, aren't really prepared for that. Um, if you've heard jazz, it, and it, this is how it sounds to you. That's Bebop. <laughs> you can thank Charlie Parker for that. He was amazing. But uh, early on, when I started playing saxophone when I was in fourth grade and probably by high school, I was really into it. I was really into jazz and like trying to understand it. I could never wrap my head around Charlie Parker. And that was largely because I was trying to look at I was trying to listen to each note and what was happening as opposed to taking his music by phrases. Um, What he does really well is he gives the full breadth of a breath. You know, so he breathes in and he will play 272 notes in that breath, but it's not about the notes. It's about the contour of the melody and the way that it's moving with uh, the uh, portal structure of the music that's giving you an expression and a feeling. Um, And then the way he ties those phrases together becomes uh, a larger picture. So by kind of uh, expanding my uh, vision, so to speak, outwards as opposed to being so granular like allowing this music to roll over me i start to get a a really good idea of the the feeling he was trying to communicate um, which was helpful for me because i am also guilty of using a lot of words in my sentences or being verbose or not knowing when to stop but also uh the ability to like add melody into um into those kind of monologues for lack of a better word to kind of help give some stability to a listener so Charlie Parker, plus it, it was really encouraging to me when I started to, to read about him, read his uh, biographies and to know that like, he was also a talker. He would have been an amazing podcaster. He never shut up. So he talked exactly like he played saxophone, which is with these beautiful um, multi-syllabic uh, phrases. So when I feel like I'm at my best, I'm using melody and I'm using phrasing in my communication to hopefully help kind of connect with the audience. Oh, that's fascinating. Never really thought about that in in jazz in that way. But as you mentioned it, there are just so many parallels, I think, to effective communicators in, in jazz or even just music in general, really thinking about tone, volume, pace inflection, how you use all of those tools when you're communicating very similarly to how a musician may use you know, the melody or the pace or putting out so many notes. And I don't know very much about music, but just you know the way that they can use their instrument to convey a message, very similarly, a change in your tone or change in your inflection or your body language is going to convey that out to your audience. I know that's, uh, that's fascinating. I love it. Ryan, as we're wrapping up here, what piece of closing advice would you have around the importance of communication skills, the impact that they, that they can have on someone's career? And you know, this could be for somebody that's coming out of school, thinking about, do I go to college? Do I enter the workforce? Do I start my own thing? I could be mid-career, looking for a change. But I think these are pretty universal concepts. So what, what advice would you have for them really around communication skills? I think if if you have intention of being a good communicator, you know, start by being kind and patient to yourself. It's going to take a lifetime <laughs> to figure it out. If you got grandpas, there's a reason why they only speak in puns because they've grown tired of normal communication. <laughs> now everything is just riffing. Um, so realizing that like becoming a good communicator takes a long time. The second part is really um, learning how to listen intently. Um, and and figure out the communicators that are important to you and try and devise what they're doing. How are they, how, why are they so, so good at communicating? Um, we, again, we have the, the, the great benefit of, of podcasts and audio books, and there's just so much audio where we can really focus in as opposed to video where you kind of get bedazzled by the visuals, Mm -hmm. but really studying audio is a great way to try and kind of uh, reverse engineer the techniques people are using to to communicate. Um, That could be a big help. And then I think the third thing really is understanding that everybody wants what you want. If you want to be a good communicator, that means you want people to listen to you. So go listen to them. 
you know, and, and the way you can show that you're listening is by asking good journalistic follow-up questions by um, doing what you're doing is providing synapses on the end of someone's uh, sentence to kind of summarize what they just said. There, there's nothing that that signals communication better than repeating what somebody just said right back to them. Um, it, it's a feeling of ease. It's a feeling of trust, again, that like, okay, my vibrating vocal cords are vibrating your eardrums in a way that I wanted it to. It's very reassuring feeling. So understanding as a, to be a good communicator, you got to understand what it means to be a good listener. And then hopefully somebody will reciprocally do that for you someday. Fantastic advice. And one of the beautiful things about all of this is that there are countless opportunities to practice these skills, whether it is just finding a friend and having a conversation, try to eliminate those distractions, making sure that you are listening intently. And with so many podcasts out there, and as you were mentioning that, it came to me that I kind of do this is that I'll be listening to a podcast and I'll find myself kind of just in my mind responding. I, I would have said this, or I would have said that. And I find that if I, and one of my favorites is Conan O'Brien needs a friend. I think he's just such a great communicator, great storyteller, very humorous. And sometimes he'll say something that in my mind, I respond before the guest or respond before somebody on his show. And I'm like, oh yeah, that was better. Or uh, I was in line with maybe what he was saying. So there's these great opportunities just to listen to something that's already been recorded. Listen, take it in. You can then pause it and think of what would I ask back? What would I say in response to that? So like I said, so many opportunities out there where you can practice, 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 because that will ultimately help you improve those skills. I agree 100%. You got to get the reps. I'm a big fan of that. Like I said, before we jumped on, we were both talking about uh, our, our kids and sports. And you got to talk about it. You got to get those reps in. The more reps you get in, the more comfortable you're going to get. You're going to build that muscle memory. And then it starts to come naturally. So absolutely. That's it. Brian. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. I really did enjoy it and, and wonderful to meet you. I appreciate it. Take care. A special thanks again to my guest, Ryan Estes. Ryan's points about storytelling are spot on. You need to consider your audience and give them a roadmap of where you are taking them in order to keep them engaged. As always, if you are looking to improve your communication skills, be sure to subscribe to Communicast so that you can continue to learn from my guests with each new episode. And if you found value in the show, leaving us a rating or review would be appreciated. Thanks and have a great day.